Good evening. I appreciate you tuning in this evening, and I hope that you're doing okay. We're in the middle of a great study about marriage. It's taken from the fifth chapter of the letter written to the Ephesians by the Apostle Paul. We're talking about the different aspects of marriage and its importance as God has uh, ordained it from the very beginning. And if you would, let's bow together and let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you and Father, we praise you as the creator of the heavens and the earth. We're thankful to you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, for his death upon the cross that you raised him again from the dead on the third day. Father, for the hope of eternal life that we have in him. Father, we're so thankful for your word that we can read and study it. We learn about you. We learn about the things that you would have us to do. And Father, we learn about how that you created the earth and uh, how you ordained marriage and the different roles in it. And Father, we're so thankful for this knowledge and it redounds to your honor and glory. And Father, we pray you'll be with us this evening as we strive to come to a better understanding of what it means to uh, be married and to come together as one. And Father, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about the what the scripture says about marriage. We emphasized last week and went into a, a more detailed look of the different needs of men and women. And what's found in the scripture as Paul commanded the husbands, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We talked about how that is actually a command. Uh, it's a command that translated literally is husbands keep on loving your wives. You'll find Paul also uses the same command basically in Colossians chapter three and verse 19 and in two, it's found as a command, husbands love your wives. And the King James Version says, and be not bitter against them. The English Standard Version says, be not harsh against them. Again, it's found with that same idea of husbands are to love their wives with that agape form of love, uh, that type of love that's an unselfish love that seeks the other's highest good. And it's based upon the example, as Paul said there in Ephesians 5 and 25, it's based upon the example of Jesus and how he gave up his life uh, for the church. And that's how much that he loved her. And so it's an example for the husbands that that is the way that they are supposed to uh, love their wives as well. Uh, that's challenging because it deals with, as we talked about those uh, different needs that men and women have and how the top needs of, of men are different than the top needs of women and the top needs of women are different than the top needs of men. And so then that leads us to a challenge. Uh, the challenge is to be able to really communicate with one another. And th these are uh, the realities of life when we think about that concept of love. I talked about it last week about how important it is for us to uh, say to our wives and, and to our husband, we, we love you, and I love you, and how powerful those words are. Uh, we talked about how it's important to continue today all through your married life. Uh, it's what caused you to fall in love with each other and that attention that you focus on one another and the care that you have for each other and the hours that you spent together in uh, meeting those needs. And when you're dating, you did it unconsciously. But yet, for it to continue, it, it has to be a deliberate choice. That's another interesting thing about the Greek word for the word love, agape. Uh, it's discriminating love. It's a choice. Uh, we choose. Uh, when Jesus used about loving our enemies, uh, he used that word. And so that's only going to happen with a deliberate choice. But I think it has this application to marriage too, it does really take a determination to do that. It takes a determination to continue to do that. And where we continue to think about our spouse and we continue to 
learn about their needs. And that leads me to the first major point that I want to talk about tonight. Implied in that ability for us, because we're not Jesus Christ. Jesus could read the hearts of men and women. He knew what they needed. He knew what the church needed because he was omniscient. And whereas we're not omniscient, and it's so important that we are able to communicate uh, with our spouse. But to be able to do that, there's something that's absolutely implied in that that's necessary. And that is there has to be a determination on both parties, both on the husband and the wife, that they're going to be 100% honest with each other. They're going to be a, like an open book to their spouse. We understand that that lying is wrong. In Ephesians chapter five and verse, uh, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter four and verse 25, Paul would say this, wherefore put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Well, he's saying that is in the church and in society that's true, but how much more is that even true between a husband and wife? They have to be able and willing to speak honestly about their feelings. They have to be uh, willing and honest and, and to open up to the other person so that that other person might get to know them as deeply as they can. The reason that this is important is the more that we know about each other, the more that we understand each other's needs, the more accurately that we're able to help one another and how, how more accurately we're able to meet those needs. Very, very important. One of the things sometimes that husbands and wives get into trouble about is that they will, with good intentions, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll lie to each other. They won't tell the truth to each other. Um, the wife may um, be cooking a meal and she's cooked a meal and the husband eats it and for some reason maybe it's a casserole that night and and he doesn't really like that casserole and his wife asks him, well, what did you think about the casserole that, that I cooked tonight? Well, he may be tempted to say, oh, it was really good, even though it wasn't one of his favorites. Well, he may get to eat that the next two years every Thursday night because he told her that he really liked it because he didn't want to hurt her feelings. What might be better to say is, well, that one I didn't care for so as much as some of your other dishes that you cook that are really good. And you know, it, it, it's to be honest about it. And, and that's in, in different things as we uh, make that commitment to each other that, that we're going to tell the truth. We're not going to be mean. And you know, one of my favorite books from several years ago is uh, One Minute Manager. And the One Minute Manager's rule, it says for... For every honest criticism, you make sure that you sandwich it between two compliments. And uh, I think that's a very, very good rule. I might even say between four and five compliments uh, sometimes. You, you don't want to hurt their feelings, you love them, but you want to let them know how you really feel about things. One of the most important things that a, a young couple has to learn to do is that they have to learn how to express anger uh, constructively. And, and that's not easy to do. We know that, that James tells us that we're to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We know he talks about, that's James 1 and 19, but then in James 1 and 20, he says, for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. And one of the most important things that husbands have to do and wives is, is to learn how to control their anger, to control their temper. Uh, that verse that I quoted earlier out of Colossians 3 and verse 19, when Paul says uh, there in Colossians 3 and 19, where he's dealing with husbands, love your wives and be not harsh against them. And, and I like that wording that's saying, and embittered is the way the, the um, uh, King James Version puts it, but, but that absolutely is the truth. How, I always, and we have a situation, and I don't care, you know, there are some married couples that go through life and they've been married 50, 60 years and they'll say, oh, we never had a cross word between each other. We never had an argument. We never had a disagreement. Uh, I'm not saying that that's impossible. I'm not discounting what anybody's saying, but 
the way I like to put it is for the 99.9% .9 of the rest of us, you have to learn how to express anger constructively. You have to learn how to control your temper. Sometimes it, it just works this way. It's different between dating and being married. Uh, when you're dating, you're at your best. And, and when you're dating, you're trying to find out, you're trying to please the other person. You're trying to find out as much about that other person as you can. Uh, you're focused upon them. They see you at your best because they see you in a limited time frame where your hair's all combed, you're on your best behavior, and all those kind of things that go with dating. That's how you win that person's heart. Uh, but once you become married, then you're around that person all the time. You see them during the good times, you see them during the bad times, and you want to be careful in your interaction with them. Uh, something that Willard Harley likes to say in his book, and I think it's a good description of it, he, he describes uh, the feeling of falling in love as he calls it a love bank. And just for illustration's sake, we'll say, here you have this couple, they're together, they're dating, uh, they're being nice to each other. They're having all these good experiences together. And so uh, it, there's love units that they're putting in each other's bank. And so let's say when they reach that thousandth love unit, that's when they begin to start to have that feeling of being in love with each other and they fall in love with each other. But what happens is, is an interesting scenario that once you're married, you have good experiences and you have bad experiences. Part of that comes from just life itself because the real realities of life begin to set in and there are things that happen in life that sometimes are difficult to go through. So that deposit of those love units in that love bank goes up and down. But something that's very important is we maintain throughout all that is that we make sure that the experiences that we have together uh, we want the very more good ones than there to be bad ones. And that's what keeps putting deposits in that love bank that keeps it above that level of, of that uh, thousand unit threshold of that feeling in love. So you, it, it's filled with a lot of different things that are made up of life as we go about and living it. But it deals many times with the attitude that we have toward each other. The Apostle Paul talks about it in Ephesians 4 and 26, and we talked about it a few weeks ago, where he said, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And one of the things that I have noted from that verse is that the first half of that verse, be ye angry, is in a passive voice. It's something that's done to you. There are things in life that sometimes happen that cause us to become angry. It may be how somebody's treated us. It may be something that they've said to us. And, and so there are things that can happen that, that cause us to be angry. But what Paul then turns around and then he commands is, he says, be angry. And he said, and sin not. And he says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So at the end of the verse, what he's saying is, oh yes, there are things that can happen that can cause us to be angry. What God calls, uh, uh, holds us responsible for is, how do we react to that anger? Do we act upon that anger? And we have to be careful not to. We have to be a, a willing to act upon that anger in a loving way, in a constructive way. And, and then he deals with this thought, which is very good too. He says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And so the emphasis is to, to let all that be settled before the sun sets. So he's talking about that you don't carry that anger over into the next day and the next day where it turns into uh, resentment and bitterness. And so he's letting, saying, I like to put it this way, let all accounts be settled by that night. Let everything be settled and don't carry it over. So that's a real important characteristic to have in that. One of the things that that has to teach us too, and, and this is true sometimes, and all of us know that it's so, uh, we can have disagreements. Uh, we can have different ways of doing things. Every human being is, is, is unique. Uh, I know sometimes uh, cusp, uh, couples are different even in how that they uh, squeeze toothpaste out of uh, the toothpaste tube. You know, some people squeeze it in the middle, some of them squeeze it at the end. Uh, I know with Crystal and I, I laughingly say that 
Crystal will get all the toothpaste out of that tube almost down to where you need a pair of pliers to squeeze the end of it to get all of it out. By the time it's gotten down to that point, I'm ready to go. Before it's gotten to that point, I'm ready to go to the next tube. But that's fine if she keeps working on that old tube till she gets all of the, the toothpaste out of it. Um, another thing that's along that line too, uh, sometimes it can get down to the silly things almost in a certain way. It, it may be how one folds the towels versus how another one folds the towels. But as long as the towels get folded, what difference does it make? Uh, it, it, it's okay. But each individual is different and sometimes we have occasions in which, and even people that love each other, uh, can have a disagreement with each other. And one of the things that's so important, I like to put it, is like learn how to argue nice. Learn how to disagree in a nice way. And, and learn how to work through conflict because conflict is a part of living. And I was reading today just to remind myself of certain things and, and I ran across something that Willard Harley said and he said, he said, when my wife and I are together, he said, we'll have about one conflict an hour. And I thought, well, boy, that's very, very interesting in what he's talking about that. But he's saying, what we've learned is how to negotiate through conflict. And that absolutely is the truth. It's to be careful uh, how that we treat one another. And if we're feeling angry, um, it's better to think about what we say and to be careful not to, if, if our mind's saying, don't say that, don't say that, it's being able to control our tongue to where we say, I'm not gonna say that. It is when we're angry that we wait uh, till we uh, are calmed down to where we can talk in a more rational way. The reason that I want to talk about this is because that idea of really communicating, is it, 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 it's a hard thing to do. It sounds easy, but, but communication is a great challenge. I mentioned to you last week that women on average speak about 20,000 words uh, in a day and men on average speak about 12,000 words in a day. And so you have a difference even in just the amount of words that we say. Sometimes uh, we don't spend the time when we're married we, and uh, that, that goal of 15 hours a week of undivided attention, that's very, very important to keep that sense of closeness uh, between each other but involved in that 15 hours of undivided attention toward one another. Uh, we talked about last week that second most common need that women have of intimate conversation, but really being able to really communicate with each other. We're in our marriages, we're not two ships that pass in the night, but rather what we are is, is two ships that are on a journey together. And it's gonna take commitment for that to happen. It's a commitment that says that I'm not going anywhere. I have married you for life and, and I'm staying here and I'm working together with you till we become one. I like one of the things that one of my friends used to do when he was counseling uh, married couples. Uh, his name was John Davis, who was a preacher from Beaumont, Texas. And uh, he did a lot of counseling between couples. And one of the things he used to do is when couples were having problems, he had, he had two chairs that were in his office that swiveled. And what he would do, he would start like this. He would, he would get the wife to talk to her husband and to tell him what the problems were that they were having. And so she would tell him. And so then he would have the husband turn and toward her. Of course, as they're talking, they would turn toward each other. And he would have the husband now, now you tell her, repeat to her what you think she just said to you. And so the husband would do that. And John said that then he'd have the wife, okay now wife, you tell him again what you're trying to communicate to him. And he would have him say it again and say to her, now, now tell us what do you think that she was saying to you and have the husband. And he would keep them doing that till they had really communicated to each other. And I, I like this definition of communication. Communication is this, when the picture that I have in my mind 
is the picture that is in that person's mind that I'm trying to communicate with. When that's arrived, when I reach that point, that's when real communication's taken place. Now, in fairness, I want us to understand something about that. Not is it just that picture, because what we're talking about is, it, it includes even more than that. It is that it includes the feelings that I have, that I've communicated that to my spouse to the thoughts that I have in my mind or what I've communicated those thoughts to my spouse, to the problems that I'm feeling. This is making me feel this way. Or this is how I feel about this. And until that picture is in the, the mind of my wife, and then uh, if, if it's emotional pain that I'm feeling, it is that, that I am expressing that till she understands what it is that I'm feeling. And, and then it, it, it combines in both of that so that they both understand what I'm saying and they understand what I'm feeling too. And to really do that takes time. And it takes two people who are active listeners. That, that thing that James says is one of the toughest things there is to do. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James 1 and 19. And, and it, Im, it implies this through a command, really. This is what I have to take. I have to be willing to listen first. And that idea of listening is that I'm really careful to pay attention to what they are saying. That I'm really listening so that I can understand what it is that they're striving to communicate to me. And when that happens, and here's something else that we got to be careful about too, is that we don't need to be thinking about what is it that I'm about to say. In fact, we need to be slow to speak. We need to, to hold back and, and let our mind really focus on them. Eliminate the distractions and be careful to eliminate the distractions. The truth of the matter is, even with a married couple, and a married couple that love each other, sometimes they're going to say things or they're going to do things uh, that hurts the other's feelings. It's just a part of life. It, sometimes those things happen. And the attitude that those are received in, then they become very important. I want to read to you a verse, one that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, but I want you to think about it in the context of the marriage relationship. In uh, Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse 31, it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, I wanna put this in a marriage context for just a minute. First of all, he says, let all bitterness, He's saying, do away with all bitterness. Then the next thing he does is he says, do away with all blowing up kind of anger is the first word there. Then there's another Greek word for anger that's used in the second one, and that's the kind of grudge-bearing anger where you've done me wrong, and I'm not going to blow up on you, but sometime or another I'm going to pay you back for this. And it's that kind of resentment that's held in the heart that that builds over time. It's like Esau was nursing that anger over uh, Jacob uh, stealing his blessing. And he was nursing it with this thought. He said, well, when my, my father is dead, then I'll kill Jacob. It's that kind of anger. But then there's another thing that he uses here too. He uses the word, the King James Version says clamor. That's talking about shouting or yelling is what that word really means. And then the next word, as it's used in this context of blasphemy, uh, deals with, uh, uh, or evil, evil speaking, excuse me, it deals with insulting. So that's insult. So both yelling, and then the next thing he says is being insulting is wrong too to your spouse. And then by the time he comes to the end of verse 31, he says, and with it, putting away all malice, well, malice is an interesting word. If you look it up, it means it's seeking to injure another. If you were talking about abuse and you were saying, what is abuse? No matter what kind it is, whether you're talking about emotional abuse, whether you're talking about um, 
uh, physical abuse, anywhere, any, anything where you're deliberately doing something to make the other person unhappy, it, it's just simply not right. And, and so as you think about that and anything that injures that other person, anything that harms that other person, so that, that covers a broad, broad spectrum of things in that. And it deals with the kind of attitude that, that we ought to have toward one another. Now, with that idea, though, that sometimes, no, no matter what we do, sometimes we, we might hurt the other person's uh, feelings. Um, we have to be willing to forgive. There's an attitude that he brings out in in the next verse, in verse 32 of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians, where he says, Be ye tenderhearted, kind one to another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And so that when that atmosphere, there always has to be that atmosphere of kindness and that atmosphere of forgiving. What forgiveness allows you to do is that forgiveness allows you to start over. Isn't it wonderful? that when we become Christians, God forgives us of our sins. Isn't that wonderful? Because it allows us to begin a relationship with God again. Well, that's one of the reasons that forgiveness is so important in, in, in a marriage relationship. Because what it allows us to do is say, I, I'm sorry I said that. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings by what I said. Or it is, I'm sorry I hurt you by what I did. And, and it allows us to begin again. And then I love that, that phrase, tenderhearted. We're to be kind to each other. Well, there's so many marriages. That's one of the most important things that it needs is it needs kindness. It needs two people that are striving to always to be kind to each other. Remember something that Jesus taught us too. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, as we pray, he taught us, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he, he built into how important that even in the family of God, even in the church, how important that forgiveness is in that. And you remember something that Jesus also taught Peter in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, where Peter had asked him that question about, shall, shall I forgive my brother seven times? And he said, 70 times seven. And he's taught unlimited forgiveness. And he ends that great chapter after he's told that parable of the unforgiving servant. He's talked about how important it is to forgive from the heart and so in marriage, that is just a very, very important thing. We want to be careful that we focus upon the good points of our spouse. You know, we can get negative and we can nitpick this and nitpick that, but we need to focus upon their good points. And I always want to remind you of something in this too, and I pointed this out last week. In a marriage, there's three parties involved in that. There's God man and woman and we have to understand that god is the one that has to meet the deepest needs that we have in our life our greatest deepest needs are met by him and that frees us to be able to love our spouse the way that we should i wanted to talk about too this evening about some things to avoid uh, some things that will damage the marriage relationship and one of them that's so important is a, is a lack of commitment, a, a, a lack of oneness, a lack of spending the time together that you should. Uh, people sometimes, uh, nowadays, they, uh, they're so busy, they basically live two separate lives. Uh, many of them have different careers and different jobs and they're so time pressed uh, for the time that they have to spend together and then they have two different goals in life. Uh, many times people fail to recognize the difference between men and women. And because of that, they'll keep thinking they're meeting their spouse's needs and they're not because they haven't found out what they were and been careful to learn how to meet that need. And so it keeps uh, rising up in their, mar their marriage. Another thing that happens too, 
and I want to reemphasize this, and it can't be emphasized enough. To have a good marriage takes effort on both parties. You know, the Bible teaches us as far as salvation is concerned. In Hebrews chapter 2, there's a statement made by the Hebrew writer, and I want you to turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 2, and I want to look beginning in verse 1 of that chapter. The writer says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time that we should drift away from them. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The statement of that that's profound that the writer's making there is he's talking about the danger of neglecting salvation. And that is a danger, and all of us need to be aware of it. We don't need to drift away from the things that we have learned and we've been taught from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to give our Christian life the proper attention and effort and dedication and commitment it deserves. But what's also true of that is true of the marriage situation too in the relationship. And that is we don't want to neglect that relationship. If we neglect it, I, I, I like to say this to, to young couples that are thinking about getting married. I, I try to point out to them that your, your relationship is like a baby, a newborn baby that cannot take care of itself. If you neglect it, it dies. The same thing is true of love in a marriage relationship. If you neglect that love, if you neglect that relationship, and you just think, oh, it's just going to take care of itself, it won't. It can't. It is that it has to be fed by both of you, and, and you have to feed that relationship and take care of that relationship and covet that relationship. And, and that's when it flourishes but it won't take care of itself. The reason that, that a lot of marriages suffer it is from a lack of communication. And the reason that that communication is so important is that people change throughout their lives. One of the great examples of this is out of the book of Genesis. And think about how much that Jacob and Esau changed through time. Of course, their story was a wonderful story. Two brothers, they're separated. One wanted to kill the other, but they were apart from each other for about 20 years. And when they came back together, uh, they renewed that relationship and ended up, they, they buried their father together, Isaac, and, and they were in harmony at that time. And, but they were different people and they had been different and grown different during the years. But in a marriage relationship, that same thing is true between two people, husband and wives. They're growing, they're changing. Life changes us. Uh, we grow up, we mature. And because people change, and they change constantly throughout their lives, uh, and they have different experiences of things that happen to them and things that they go through together, then uh, communication becomes very important because they keep having to adjust to those changes. Another thing that happens too is that people grow apart with a lack of communication. Uh, there's a verse found in Matthew 24 and verse 12 uh, where Jesus states, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. And the, the thing that just stands out to me, that verse is the circumstances of what were happening uh, of that time period that he was talking about or right before the destruction of Jerusalem and what happened through the destruction of Jerusalem that that would cause many, many uh, their love for God to grow cold. But when the marriage relationship, the same thing is true where good communication is not taking place, where you're not meeting each other's needs, where you're not continuing to grow together, what can end up happening is that you can grow apart. Now, sometimes in that it can take years for that to happen, that process of growing apart. But it absolutely can happen. It may take 20 years. It may 20, take 25. It might take 40 years. 
but you can see the cracks in that marriage begin to come and those individuals start to, to grow apart and they start having disagreements with each other and, and arguments with one another uh, because they're not meeting each other's needs and actually they're doing things to insult, to harm each other. And, and so with that time, they can just grow completely indifferent to each other. Uh, most divorces don't happen in a day. Most divorces take place over decisions and things that were done over years of time. And then another thing that happens too is uh, hurt feelings that can take place. And, and those things happen and they're unresolved. I remember reading about a guy one time he was talking about, he had this couple coming to him and he said they were fussing and fighting with each other. And uh, as he listened to them, he, he could tell that they were arguing over something, some things that had happened over about 20 years ago. And so he just wrote the date down and said, all right, forgive each other and you ain't gonna talk, you're not gonna talk about this anymore of what happened 20 years ago and you're just gonna settle that and we're going on from that. Solve their problem right there. They were arguing over something and holding something against each other, not forgiving each other for something that happened a long time ago. So that can happen as well. Always, uh, there needs to be a striving for understanding and acceptance. I want to talk about one more thing that damages marriages, and that is materialism. We know that 1 Timothy 6 and 10 says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. But materialism has an effect on the husband-wife relationship too. It's interesting, a lot of times, some of the best times that a young couple has is when they're starting out. They don't have anything. They're just getting by week by week. They don't have financial decisions to make because all their money's spent. They have to make the good ones and there's nothing left over. So they're not talking about, am I gonna buy this new car? Or am I gonna buy this new dress? Am I gonna buy this new boat? Am I gonna buy this new rod and reel or this new gun? So they're not, they don't have that to be able to discuss. And, and it's interesting that some of the best times they'll remember is when they had nothing. And you know, I always remember something that Dave Ramsey says on this. He says, stuff can always be replaced. Relationships are what matter. And that is absolutely the truth. Life is not made up of how much stuff can I accumulate? How much stuff can I buy? That's not what life's all about. Uh, many times it's when incomes begin to rise up that people have trouble because she wants to buy furniture, he wants to buy a new boat. And so they're, they're arguing over how they're going to spend their money. And sometimes this happens too. You'll have somebody who's real conservative and tight with their money, and then you'll have another person, the other spouse will love to spend money. And so you have a disagreement in that about how money should be spent. And uh, we're gonna talk about some in just a moment about how that if we settle those things. There's a list that Willard Harley gives in his book of love busters of things that destroy romantic love. And I, I wanted to list these with you uh, this evening. He calls them love busters. Uh, at the top of his list is selfish demands. When I feel like that my needs are not being met by my spouse, then if I'm not careful, it is I, I make a selfish demand of her. It is why uh, why hadn't you cleaned the house or or why hadn't you uh, uh, ironed my shirts? It could be stuff along that line. Just anything in that line that's a need that an individual has, they can make a selfish demand of it. Uh, disrespectful judgments. He says selfish demands lead to, and he, he makes a good point. He says, everyone has their own opinions and their own way of doing things. And when I try to impose my opinion or my will upon my spouse, if I'm not careful, I will make this uh, respectful judgments of her. Oh, that chicken just doesn't taste like mother's chicken or that uh, Italian cream cake doesn't taste like mother's Italian cream cake. 
<laughs> it's just stuff like that of, of disrespectful judgment they're made many times filled with insult and then what happens is that it leads to angry outbursts one of the reasons that I want to talk about angry outbursts right here is because we want to be very careful of them one of the reasons that James makes that statement for the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God is when we let our tempers control us and we say something or we do something that's hurtful to our spouse. Maybe it is that we're in a disagreement with them and it gets heated and we say something that we shouldn't, uh, insulting them in one way or another. Um, that causes many withdrawals from the love bank right there. Whereas we might be up at 700, it might withdraw 50 uh, love bank units all in one outburst. And so, really important because one of the things that happens is that we'll find many times either the argument will become worse and worse or that other person will withdraw and it just closes them up on the inside because nobody likes to get hurt even if we're talking about something that's nothing physical but it's just verbal it's still on the inside of them they will close up because they're going to protect themselves they might become quiet but we've done great harm in the process. I'm going to show, us, show you some ways to overcome that. If we're not honest with each other, our spouse may be doing something, and because we're not brave enough to tell them how we really feel about that, they may be doing something that's annoying us. They don't even know it because we didn't tell them. We didn't share it with them. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to be careful doing that. Don't get me wrong. You do. But at the same time, you have to be honest enough to let them know how you really feel in a nice way. And then annoying habits. If there's something that we're doing that gets on their nerves, um, want to be careful to change that habit. Uh, independent behavior where somebody's going off on their own, where they're going out with the gals by themselves, they're going out with the guys by themselves, they're, they're, they're living out there in their life by themselves. I had a good friend that he and his wife did this uh, for several years and that marriage didn't last that long. But you could see it coming because they lived uh, separate lives. Uh, I recommend to you that book, Love Busters by Willard Hardy. It's very, very good. And there's some things that he points out in that that I want to share with you quickly. And I love this concept and I'm I know that this book's just written by a man. I understand that. It, it's not perfect. Every little thing that he says, I don't agree with. But, but the basic principle of something that he puts forward. And when you're, when you're striving to solve, you're trying to get your spouse, you're, you're trying to show them that there's something that you need them to do for you, something that they're not doing and you're, you're trying to stay away from disrespectful judgments where uh, you're, you're not doing a good job at doing this, uh, you're, you're not spending enough time with the kids, or, or, or you're not keeping the house clean enough, or you don't have supper ready, or all these different things that go on with married life. He, he deals with this thought, and it says, four guidelines for successful negotiation in a marriage. And I want to share... Uh, these things with you. He says, the first thing is that you have a joint agreement. This is what you're trying to do. The joint agreement says that, that you're not going to do something till you both enthusiastically agree on it. And here's how you set the rules for it. It says, try to be pleasant. You set these ground rules. Negotiation is going to be pleasant and it's going to be safe. I know some of y'all are saying, how are you going to do that every time? You need to set it as a goal to do this every time. He says, try to be pleasant, cheerful throughout all your negotiation. He says, ground rule number two, put safety first. He says, don't make demands, don't show disrespect, 
If you become angry, don't you let yourself become angry even if your spouse does. Ground rule number three, if you reach an impasse and you don't seem to be getting anywhere, or if one of you starts making demands or showing disrespect or becoming angry, stop negotiating and come back to the issue later. See, he doesn't want you getting mad. He doesn't want you getting angry. He's saying stop. And in fact, one of the things, and we'll talk about this in just a moment, guideline number two, he says, identify the problem from both perspectives. Now, what I like about this is that wording that he's using is well thought out. He's saying, identify the problem from both perspectives. That is, the wife gets a chance to say what her perspective of the problem is, then the husband turns around and he gets to say what his perspective of the problem is. Now, what I like about that is because what I run into a whole lot with people and married couples, they can tell me what the problem is and they can be real accurate and they can do this and they can do that. And, but you let them try to get to telling each other the same thing they've just told me, they can't see it. I can see it plain as day but neither one of them can see the other's perspective. It's an amazing thing. I don't know why it is. I guess it's because they got a dog in the hunt in a way I don't have a dog in the hunt and it just makes it different. But the time to take out time to really consider your spouse's feelings, to try to put yourself in, for me, it would be to put myself in my wife's position so that I understand what her perspective is and that I respect her perspective and then she's able to look at what I'm saying and appreciate my perspective on it. Then the next thing he says is brainstorm with abandonment. abandonment. So what he's talking about is he's saying you brainstorm a solution. You're trying to come up with a solution which both of you are enthusiastic about. That is that it's taking that other person's feelings into consideration. You know, I know that the scripture teaches us for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. And, and when Paul's writing that, he's not saying to husbands, don't you regard your wife's feelings. You just do whatever you want to do. You just be domineering. That, that's not what he's talking about. That's not how Jesus was with the church. Jesus knew what the needs of the church were. He didn't have to have it explained to him, but for you and I as husbands, um, we have to be willing to listen uh, to our wives and listen to our spouses so that, that we're taking her into consideration. We, we love her, so we have to take her into consideration because sometimes we might not be able to see something that she's trying to point out, but it's needful for us to be able to see it because it figures into this decision that needs to be made. And so if we can come up with an alternative that both are enthusiastic about, and then that's the fourth guideline, choose the solution that meets the guidelines of the policy of joint agreement, where both are mutually and enthusiastically in agreement with what's being done. When you strive for that, then you have peace. When I thought about that, I thought about how many different scriptures deal with this thought and how that we understand that, that Jesus taught this very openly. In Matthew chapter seven, verse 12, uh, the, the golden rule that Jesus states there, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You remember when he was teaching, one time a scribe asked him, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said in Matthew 22 and verse 37, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And then he went on to say, though, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So then you got in Leviticus 19 and 18 is what he's quoting there. Well, that it implied in that love our neighbor as ourself. It how we would want to be treated, that's how we're to treat others. 
And, and we understand that. We say, oh, yes, that's the golden rule to live by. Well, it's the golden rule to live by in the church. It is. It's a golden rule to live by in the world. It is. But it's also the golden rule to live by in marriage, too. And in that, you think what's implied in that. The way I would like to be treated, that's how I'm going to treat my spouse. Yeah, that's right. And so in doing that, then I have to take her feelings into consideration. I would want her to take my feelings into consideration. I would want her to take my perspective into consideration. I'd want her to take my opinion into uh, perspective. I would want her to take my ways of doing things into perspective too. So you'll see that it's just repeated over and over again. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Every man mind not his own thing, but the things of others. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul commanded that to the Philippians, how they were to treat each other, same way we should treat each other. Think about we've emphasized over and over again, Ephesians chapter 5 and 25, that a God ain't kind of love. Absolutely, that's right. That unselfish love that seeks the other's highest good. And boy, if you had that, you have two people in marriage that love each other with an unselfish love and they're seeking each other's highest good, you're going to have a good relationship. I want to share one more with you and I want you to think about just a moment. We could go to the Christian graces and I would commend you to go read those in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. But I want to share with you tonight the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to think about its implications for marriage. Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now you take those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit and you think about their implications in marriage. It heads the list in Galatians 1. It finishes the list in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He says, you love with an unselfish love that seeks the other person's highest good. Joy and peace. Is peace important in marriages? Absolutely it is. How about being long-suffering? How about being long-tempered? Is that important in marriage all the time? It ought to be something we just clothe our minds in toward our spouses. Gentleness? Does kindness count? Does it matter? Yeah. Goodness? How about faith? And there's some scholars that say it should be it carries with the idea of faithfulness. Does faithfulness matter in a marriage? It's the most important characteristic there is. It's number one. Right, right tied in with love, because I don't see how you can separate those two things, love and faithfulness. But yes, faithfulness. Meekness count? Is it good to be meek? Is it good to be under control, under God's control? And then, of course, temperance, self-control, Yes, all those things matter in marriage too. And you know, it's a very interesting thing. The characteristics that it takes to be a good Christian are the great characteristics of a great marriage and how necessary they are. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We're thankful to you for how good that you have been to us. We're thankful to you for the forgiveness that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ, shedding his blood upon the cross. We're thankful that all that you have ever done has been good for, the man, for mankind, has been in mind for the benefits of the creation that you made. Father, we're thankful for the institution of marriage your wisdom in creating it, the wisdom and understanding that you've made known through your word. And Father, give us hearts that seek that wisdom and that understanding that we might live it out in our lives and that we might live it out in our marriages as well. And Father, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.